Okay, we're shooting. Nice. Okay, well, I guess uh, start off with the first question. Okie dokie. Okay, so it's Paul a test, test run, technical test run for my website. Yes. So Paul Schwartz, Paul David Schwartz. That's not my middle name. What do you feel? That's not my middle name. You have to offer. Are we gonna edit that out? No, just leave it. It's not his middle name. Um, what do I have? What do I have to offer? It's funny, the first thing that comes to me, not being a smart ass, but the first thing that comes to me is everything and nothing. Hmm. It's funny because I, I, I was thinking about this on the drive over in terms of some of the things and what I'd say. And obviously I don't want to, I don't want to come with a perspective of anything preconceived, but I was thinking, I was thinking about the word help. I don't like the word help, hmm. and because I don't feel, I mean, unless we're talking about, you know, specific context, I don't think people really need help, so I don't, the word doesn't resonate. I was thinking more a guide or a catalyst um, that, that feels more sort of organic to me. So. I can't say I, I am a perfect example of liberation or a perfect example of, um, what should I say, an awakened being, if I want to call it that, but I think, I think I can act as a catalyst in that regard, I mean, towards liberation. Um, towards those things, a movement in that direction. Um, you know, there's a saying, like, we can't, we can lead somebody to the door, but we can't walk through the door for them. So it's that kind of a thing. I mean, I think it, it, it truly needs to come down to one's own volition to do that. Hmm. But I could, I could simply be a catalyst for that. Hmm. But I think what I have to offer is towards liberation, towards getting out of one's way, um, towards how to be a pure vehicle, yeah. um, which are things that you and I have talked about a lot in the past. Right. So I would say those are the main, those are the main things. Yeah, for sure. What do you mean by liberation? <clears throat> I guess again, I would say um, cessation of the self, and I and I would mean the self, meaning the conditioned, programmed. Um, egoic self um, so freedom from that so operating more from a perspective of if I want to say pure consciousness operating more from a perspective of um, the here and now unadulterated hmm. um, so yeah I would say freedom in its truest sense but um but I think it's mostly from our own internal, our own internal, internal wars. Um, but I would say mostly from the programmed and societal and cultural programming. Um, and conditioning. Hmm. Freedom from that. So how does that happen for someone? How can you just get rid of uh, your programming, and how can you get rid of your egoic self? I don't think I don't think one can simply just get rid of it. I mean, I do think there has been people, supposedly, seemingly there has been pe there have been people that that have had you know spontaneous awakenings that supposedly have transcended that. I don't know if that's true. I don't know what their actual experience is, but there's supposedly people like Eckhart Tolle and so forth that have had you know experiences like that but I would say it's an arduous 
long process. And I think it's, it's actually a never ending process. I don't think that process ever ends. I mean, in my experience, it's been, it's been a slow progression where I've definitely noticed with hindsight, if I look back and see, you know, in a sense where I've come from where I was, um, I think a lot of it is about self-awareness. Um, one needs to truly cultivate self-awareness to be aware um, when one is putting themselves in a straitjacket, hmm. where one is coming from a conditioned perspective or a program perspective. Um, but I think it happens over a long time, and I think it's I think it's quite subtle. Hmm. But um, I think mostly with self awareness and introspection. Um, I definitely think inquiry, checking within. Um, one of the big things I mean I think to explore is one's motivation for why they do what they do. I think that's that's a, a big one in terms of where one can learn um, again what space what perspective they're coming from whether they're coming from ego whether they're coming from um, a perspective of subtle agenda whether they are giving to get um, are they coming from a pure space but um, I think a lot of it's that way I mean again through introspection and self-awareness yeah can you could you give me an example of maybe a time, just like a specific time where you uh, where you looked at your motives and uh, like you saw this? Um, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I well, I'll use the example um, in regard to my music making. I mean, I, well, in terms of the piano, why I chose to be a pianist. I think a lot of that, or the majority of it, I mean, I started when I was 11, so I started somewhat late, um, considering, you know, when most people maybe start at six or seven or whatever it may be. Um, but looking back, of course, I didn't recognize it. In, in the moment when I was choosing it, um, you know, I was so excited, so, in a sense, obsessed. And so taken by by you know being a pianist and the idea and, and the futurizing of it all, um, but looking back, I chose it. Um, there was a lot of doting on me from my parents um, in being a talented younger pianist. So it was like attention, you know. It was love. It was. Um, you're unique, you're special. Um, it was validation, you know, so I think, uh, I honestly don't know if there was really, maybe if we're talking about, which again, I, I sort of question this too in terms of the level of the soul, um, if there is a soul, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. But um, maybe on some level, in terms of maybe my essence, I was being called, um, in a way to purify myself, to look, um, to look at it as a lesson, as an opportunity to grow. Um, in terms of hindsight, looking back about why I chose it, and being able to, to quote unquote change that. But I also think, because I remember before I actually started lessons, we had a old beat up spinet that had been painted over, and my father um, wanted to refinish it, and um, we did it together. And I honestly think also part of my choosing it was to, to sort of merge with my father, to sort of get closer to him mm. and, and to find more acceptance from him. Um, he was actually sort of like my, in a way, my first teacher because he taught me some very basic lessons because mm. um, he, he was a turbo player. So he taught me a little bit about, about music, but I think that was my way to connect with him. So I think I also chose it for that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would say those are those were my big motivations. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, looking back on myself, I also like I also see those same desires um, apparent with me. I mean, I, I started playing trombone, and I, um, you know, the first thing that I wanted was approval from my friends or my teachers or my parents. 
do you think that everybody is subject to this? I do. I do. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure it can be in a sense avoided. Hmm. I mean, just being raised, you know, in a less than perfect upbringing, I think will do it, can do it, does it. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know if, I mean, in terms of like prodigies, I, I wonder in, in that case, if, if there has been a certain sense of transcendence of, of ego or, or, um, or being self-conscious. I mean, I honestly think that part of the reason why prod prodigies are prodigies is because they're not self-conscious. Hmm. I think because if they were self-conscious, then most likely they'd question themselves a lot more, which creates a lot of doubt and a lot of insecurity. Hmm. So in a way, I, again, I'm not sure about this by any means, but maybe in a case like that, it wouldn't be such a strong you know, pull or a strong wounding, let's say, to do it for um, reasons of validation. Maybe that comes a little bit later, um, in a way, as they become more conscious and more conscious in the sense of, in a way, more self-conscious. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it, if it really could be escapable. Yeah, it seems like a lot of prodigies are kind of compelled by their parents. <clears throat> there's not a lot of real self-drive behind it. Yeah, kids. I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of that too. So, um, how do you think this affects our music making? I mean, again, I can only talk from experience, my own experience. I've just seen, I mean, from the difference of, you know, going to a conservatory and wanting to please my teacher, um, sort of as you mentioned before, approval, you know, wanting their approval, wanting the approval of my colleagues, there's like this, this kind of structure or not sure what the word is, platform that we're sort of always like hooked into that we're operating from that is, is a, it's a constriction, it's a contraction. Um, there's nothing free about it. Mm. But I think that in and of itself um, is a limitation. But I think when we're sort of always under this kind of operation, I mean, we're, we're in essence a puppet because a lot unconsciously, we're, we're being run unconsciously by this idea of, you know, I need to be perfect, I need people to accept me, um, you know, this is how, this is what I equate with love, uh, all those things. So when we're not really aware of any of that or conscious of that, we're operating from that perspective. So it's like we're being driven by that. So there's always this kind of, again, super ego or self consciousness about, am I doing it right? Um, Again, am I getting their approval? Are they accepting me? Are they uh, not rejecting me? It's like we're always coming from a, a movement of, again, away from, uh, away from rejection and towards approval. And it's like that's like our, almost like our, our daily life is being run through that. Hmm. Um, and so from my perspective, in terms of my experience of that, I definitely remember that, um, you know, trying to, impress and trying to please and blah 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 and now I'll, so much of that has dropped and I just I can feel the difference in terms of like I feel like now there is a co-creating happening because I'm not constantly thinking it's it's coming more from a from a quiet space um, there's not a lot of ruminating there's not a lot of um, how should I say, uh, self beratement and uh, harsh self-talk. Hmm. Um, 
it's really being present with what I'm doing. So much of it is being present with what I'm doing in terms of this co-creation, and it's happening right here and now. And it's not happening based on anything else. It's not happening based on what I've learned, or uh, maybe that maybe that is happening unconsciously on a certain level. But I'm not consciously thinking about, oh, this is what I've done in the past. I want to emulate that again. You know, I want to regurgitate that again. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but. Again, the, that freer perspective, that, that, that open space that it's coming from, you have endless potential in terms of that co-creation. Otherwise, when you're coming from this perspective of the puppet, or this perspective, again, wanting to impress the straitjacket, how, how could one have limitless potential in that regard? Because you've already put, your, you're already put yourself in a box. You know, you've already put structure around what you can or couldn't do. Um, so, I don't know, does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I it's can, like, with, like with uh, the uh, version where the student wants to please, please his teacher or his friends or just what colleagues or parents or whatever, it's like music is a vehicle for that. Music is kind of like this yeah. thing that serves as motives. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So, what do you mean by... Uh, co-creation. Who are you? Who you're co-creating with, or what are you co-creating with? Well, I think on one hand you're co-creating with the composer, but I also think you're co-creating with reality. I mean, in the sense you are reality, you're a manifestation of reality. So, I think you're truly co-creating with reality. Um, you're you're a you're a movement of nature. Um, and when you when you let go, I mean, I guess what, uh, the way I guess I'd say it, when you let go of the the personal self, again, egoic self, whatever you want to label, there's many different terms for it. But like when you let go of that, um, and like we just talked about, when when those kind of like hindrances aren't running you, you can do whatever you want. And and in my and from my perspective, there is no right or wrong about it, as long as it's coming from a space of pure consciousness. And in a, in a way, we're, we're not really the doer in that perspective. Um, it's sort of like we're being done. Hmm. Um, the music is happening through us. Yeah. We're, not, we're not efforting to make it happen. Um, it's almost as if the space um, has its own way of, of doing it. Hmm. But, I, but I think um, just by sheer virtue of a performance, we're co-creating. Um, but I think there's, again, different levels of that, whether we're, we're how should I say, co-creating from a pure space or, or a blank slate, or are we co-creating from a space of um, tainted uh, constriction, again, operating from the space of ego. So, um, yeah. So... If you're working with a student, if you're working with a musician or a professional, yeah. and you're not feeling like this is happening, happening, you're feeling like they're maybe putting on a front when they're playing the music, or they're, it doesn't seem, it seems artificial, yeah. how do you approach that as a coach? The, I mean, what comes, what's coming up for me now, I think the, the first thing that I do, or would probably do, and again, it's different for everybody, um, is I would sort of talk to them about dropping everything. And whether that's possible or not, that, you know, I don't know if it is possible in terms of memory and that perspective, but I would say, like if they were working on a specific piece of music, I would say, drop everything you think you know about this piece of music. And, and then I would help help them cultivate that space, that quiet space that I know you and I have talked about before. Um, and usually how I do that is by having them pay attention to the sounds around them. The sounds in the room, the sounds outside of the room, just to get, to get quiet, what I call getting quiet. Um, emptiness, pure potential, um, to come from that space. 
and then I just tell them, do what you want. Just do what you want. And there's no, there's no boundaries. I mean, there's no, I mean, no holds barred. Anything, everything goes. It's like, take things out of context if you need. You know, it's not about keeping the right tempo or keeping even intonation, nothing. Again, no holds barred. I just, I just say, do whatever you want. But moment by moment, it's a, it's a conscious choosing to do that. Hmm. It's not, again, anything coming from memory or repetition. It's just whatever is unfolding in that moment, whatever is, in a sense, coming through them in that moment, to just allow it to happen. So I, I use the term surrender a lot. So it's just sort of surrendering to, to what's coming through. Um, and that also does take a little bit of cultivating guidance in that regard to sort of discern between whether it's coming from ego, personal self, or again coming from spirit, whatever you want to call it. There is, you know, there needs to sort of be a little bit of cultivating the discernment of those. But um, that's, I guess, the first thing I'd have them do is just drop everything and um, simply do what they want um, and surrender. And, and also listening. Listening is a huge part of it too. I think uh, not listening to themselves from a again a self-conscious perspective, but listening to themselves from a, as much of an objective perspective or a witness perspective. So that there's focus, there's attention, there's presence, but there's not you know there's not the the questioning. Yeah. But I think that's probably the first thing that I'd have them do. And also, I should say that that space it's it's like a meditative space. Um, it's like a it's a mindful space. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's so. So you're kind of like observing the music that you're making, the music that is, you know, that's vibrating because of you, but not you're not judging it. Right. Right. You're just you're actually just simply listening to it. Hmm. And these are all basically ways to get the egoic self or the the rational processing self out of the way when you're playing. I think so. So how did you, I mean, were you always thinking about this? I mean, like, when did you start thinking about, like, music in this way? What caused you to do that? It's funny, I, I, I honestly couldn't say. I definitely don't think there's, there's a clear-cut cause and effect in this, in this respect. I mean, the only thing that I could say is I, I, I just remember when I started therapy, um, talk therapy, but it was more of a spiritual based, spiritually based um, therapy, if I want to call it that. And I just, as I started to get to know who I was or who I thought I was, and again experiencing more liberation from that, I just sort of took from that. And again, I can't even say how I did it. I think it was just through experimenting and, and experiencing and practicing and playing with different ways of thinking and being and feeling and um, and just figured and felt, wow, this is really causing a change. How, how I perceive music making and how I interpret things and, and, and feedback. Um, but I, I would say a lot of it was just sort of getting on the road and the path to, to if I want to call it liberation, just through um, therapy. I had, I had some rough times in my life, you know, through broken relationships and uh, a lot of self-doubt and uh, low self-esteem, things of that sort. And I remember asking a friend of mine who was a, a singer, someone who I trusted, um, I mean, she was more of a mentor, and I asked her who she recommended for me to talk to, and she recommended this man. and. I mean, I, I worked with him years and years and years, and he taught me so much, and he's the one basically put me on this path, I would say. And from then, it's history. Hmm. But I would say I just, I, I took from, in, in essence, my spiritual work. I think I would say I took from my spiritual work and just sort of, in a way, shifted it to, to my work with music. So... That's I'm being I'm being general about it, but I would say that's mostly it. Yeah. So 
how do you know, like if you're if you're listening to someone perform, how do you know if it's authentic music making? That's a good question. I mean, ultimately, I don't know. Um, I can only go again based on my own uh, feelings about it. Sure. What feels true, what feels, um, like you said, authentic. It's, it's really a subtle sense. Um, I like to think I'm perceptive. I like to think I'm sensitive to those to those things um, in terms of what I pick up. But um, it's funny, you know, I, I, that's a really good question. I can't really say uh, how I know, hmm. um, or again, that I do know for sure. It's just a felt sense. Um, hmm. What do you, what do you, like if you're hearing someone who's making authentic music or what you perceive to be authentic music, what, what do you, what do you think? It just, it feels, it feels alive. There's like a there's like a mystery about it. There's like a curiosity about it, like and I sense like that curiosity coming from them, hmm. like an exploration coming from them. Hmm. Um, not again something that's just like sort of been done, like with this cookie cutter cutter mentality and doing it over and over and over again, sort of pre-planned. But it, it like it feels like I said alive and and um, feels spontaneous. Hmm. Um, so it's more, it's more based really on a felt sense of how I feel about it. Um, and I, I think, you know, body language also plays in in, toward, in terms of do they seem comfortable on their own skin? You know, do they seem like they're performing with conviction? Uh, do they seem like they're performing with integrity? It's not really about interpretation or anything like that at all. Um, but it's re really this, this sense of like... Um, Again, aliveness keeps coming up for me. Yeah. Um, it just feels alive because it feels like it's it's being again, as I mentioned earlier, co-creating. It feels like it's being created right now. Like yeah. I've never heard anything like it. And even though, yes, of course, we can never really truly emulate a performance, even if we wanted to. But there's something truly like we've never heard it. Um, so yeah, again, I probably being general but but that's what I would say yeah it's but that's a great question I have to feel into that a bit more there's nothing really defined about it no that makes total sense I mean the, the notion of the music being alive really um, really jives with your your notion of co-creation this is you know it's happening there's this no artificial agenda for yeah. the music I feel like I, I feel drawn in I guess is another thing. I feel like I feel like I'm a part of that actual process um, with this person who's performing. I mm -hmm. just I feel like I'm drawn in, mm -hmm. but um, but I'm definitely feeling like I said like a curiosity and exploration from them. I mean that's what it feels like to me also when I'm performing. Yeah. It's like I'm, I'm you know there's a there's an expression beginner's mind. There's a well known book called Zen Mind Beginner's Mind, and it's basically like looking at everything. With, with virgin eyes and it's the same thing when I, when I try when I approach a piece of music even if I've played it 50 times I try to look at it with virgin eyes with, with beginner eyes so it's, it's, um, it's that constant just like how am I relating to it now you know like what wants to reveal itself what wants to unfold um, through this vehicle of, of music hmm. um, so that's I would say that's a lot of it too hmm. um it almost has like this kind of childlike, you know, again, curiosity or like, what is this? Hmm. You know, that kind of a thing. Interesting. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the reasons why I like the word co-creator is because I, I feel a lot of people when they play music, they don't let the other part create. They want to do all the work themselves. They want to maybe stifle whatever music could be happening. So this yeah. notion of co-creating, you're you're letting something else create it with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like best way that I could put it, like I said, is like you're letting yourself be done. Huh. Um, or letting yourself be played. Huh. Um, yeah.
It's, I think it's, it's, very, it's very apt. Do you notice this in any other art forms, or do you, do you notice this? Because it, it kind of goes back to this whole <clears throat> idea of um, not letting your uh, rational or processing mind get in the way. So is this just a music thing? Or? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think, again, I think I notice it in people in everyday life away from music. Just being able to sort of get a sense, and I'm not saying again that I know, but you know whether there's a sense of authenticity. Are they are they being truly who they are? Um, are they comfortable in their own skin? Are they do they have a subtle agenda? Are they trying to get something from me? Um, you know, so I think it I think it follows suit with everything. Hmm. Um, are people being honest with themselves? Are people being honest with me? Um, that kind of a thing. Hmm. And again, I know I can't ultimately know that, but it's just, it, it's a felt sense, it's really an intuitive thing. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, I think it's all across the board. Hmm. I think it just manifests in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I know you've mentioned before <clears throat> about how we we play who we are. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that earlier. Yeah, I, I coined that phrase from, um, Parker Palmer's book, The Courage to Teach, he says, we teach who we are. And I sort of, you know, took that and we perform who we are, which I think is very, very true. Um, you know, as I talk to a lot of the people that I work with, I, I don't see how we can separate who we are as every, in everyday life and who we are as performers. So there's this aspect of, if I have a fear of vulnerability in my everyday life and relating to other people, how am I going to be vulnerable when I get up on stage? You know, I mean, maybe certain people can really turn off that, that, again, the self-conscious, uh, you know, the berating thoughts and, and that kind of stuff. But I don't think that's the norm. I think that's more the exception. So I think it's sort of an obligation as a performer to look at those things, you know, that are sort of holding us back. I mean, whether it's vulnerability, fear of vulnerability, whether it's again fear of failure, whether it's um, whether it's even about you know not feeling comfortable um, in terms of who they are, um, in terms of self-love, um, I think really it's our obligation to explore all that. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, we're choosing to be an artist. You know, I really think an artist needs to be someone who's um, well-rounded is much too generic, but um, but who's really in tune and in touch with themselves and um, doesn't have such a difficult time bearing their imperfections. Um, I think a lot of that is actually an opportunity to use that for, you know, use it energetically for the stage. Um, if we're feeling fear, use, use the energy of fear <clears throat> or use the energy that fear feels like. Hmm. Um, so I think that's that's very important, but but yeah, I, I I feel like using the example again of vulnerability. If I have a fear of vulnerability, how do I expect how do I expect to in, not to say that our agenda should be to inspire people, but how do I expect as a byproduct of me being who I am to inspire people? You know, how do I expect to to move people if I'm not moved? So I think that's you know I, I use that that phrase a lot. I actually really like that phrase. Hmm. Um, and the courage to teach is a good book. Oh. Also, so you think if you're a performer and you're not addressing personal issues, then you're doing yourself a disservice as a person, but also as a musician as well. I think so. Huh. Not only doing ourselves a disservice, but I think we're doing the audience a disservice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, again, it, we're, I mean, they're paying money to hear us. I mean. I mean, um, how should I call it? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I think we are doing themselves and ourselves a disservice. Hmm. Um, and not, not, not in the, how should I say, the, the dumbed down version of, yes, they're paying money to hear us, um, and this is what we should do, um, and this is what they're expecting or whatever it may be. I mean, it's actually another thing I've been exploring recently, which I can't say I've come to any conclusion, but I also feel that the audience 
has a certain obligation themselves, which is to be open to receive. Because I feel like a lot of audiences, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why they go to concerts, but let's say they're going to a concert to experience something, to move, to be moved. Um, in a way, I feel like they have to be receptive to that. So they can't simply be a passive observer. And I think a lot of audience members go as passive observers, sort of expecting and wanting to be like, you know, um, hit over the head with this grand experience, as opposed to, again, creating maybe an open, quiet space within themselves to be open to whatever is unfolding on stage. Hmm. So I think I want to address that more in my work, but I think that's a very important aspect of, of that kind of reciprocity. Um, definitely. Because we're obviously not up there by ourselves. Uh, and we're all, in a sense, interconnected. So we have to sort of, on some level, affect each other. Hmm. So I think, I think that, that needs to be addressed. Hmm. Not sure how... I don't have a clear view in terms of how I intend to do that, but I think it's important. Hmm. So... Yeah, for sure. I think it's good. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Paul, Paul Bartholomew Schwartz. Paul Barney Schwartz. Thank you, Andrew Friedbone. A lot of that is actually an opportunity to use that for, you know, use it energetically for the stage. Um, if we're feeling fear, use, use the energy of fear. <clears throat> or use the energy that fear feels like. Um, so I think that's that's very important but but yeah I, I, I feel like using the example again of vulnerability if I have a fear of vulnerability how do I expect how do I expect to in, not to say that our agenda should be to inspire people but how do I expect as a byproduct of me being who I am to inspire people you know how do I expect to, to move people if I'm not moved so I think that's you know I, I use that, that phrase a lot. I actually really like that phrase. Hmm. Um, and the Courage to Teach is a good book. Huh. Also. So you think if you're a performer and you're not addressing personal issues, then you're doing yourself a disservice as a person, but also as a musician as well? I think so. Huh. Not only doing ourselves a disservice, but I think we're doing the audience a disservice. Hmm. I mean, you know, again, it, we're... I mean, they're paying money to hear us. I mean, I mean, um, how should I call it? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I think we are doing themselves and ourselves a disservice. Hmm. Um, and not, not, not in the, how should I say, the, the dumbed down version of, yes, they're paying money to hear us, um, and this is what we should do, um, and this is what they're expecting or whatever it may be. I mean, it's actually another thing I've been exploring recently, which I can't say I've come to any conclusion, but I also feel that the audience has a certain obligation themselves, which is to be open to receive. Because I feel like a lot of audiences, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why they go to concerts, but let's say they're going to a concert to experience something, to move, to be moved. Um, in a way, I feel like they have to be receptive to that. So they can't simply be a passive observer. And I think a lot of audience members go as passive observers, sort of expecting and wanting to be like, you know, um, hit over the head with this grand experience, as opposed to, again, creating maybe an open, quiet space within themselves to be open to whatever is unfolding on stage. Hmm. So I think... I want to address that more in my work, but I think that's a very important aspect of, of that kind of reciprocity. Um, definitely, because we're obviously not up there by ourselves, uh, and we're all, in a sense, interconnected, so we have to sort of, on some level, affect each other. Hmm. So I think, I think that, that needs to be addressed. Hmm. Not sure how I don't have a clear view in terms of how I intend to do that, but I think it's important. Hmm. So, yeah, for sure. I think it's good. 
Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Paul, Paul Bartholomew Schwartz. Paul Barney Schwartz. Thank you, Andrew Friedbone. <laughs>